Uh, anyway, so um, next up, we have actually a double header, as it were. We have uh, Lili Zeng and Pao uh, Frises. Am I yeah, more or less. Pao All right. Frises. All right. Um, and uh, so uh, Lili's a software engineer at Google under the Tech Infra Network Systems area. Uh, he is an active member of gRPC repo and mostly contributing to gRPC Python. Focuses on API design, distributed systems, tooling. Uh, prior to Google, he got his master's degree from CMU uh, and had several years experience in tech startups at Beijing. And then uh, Pao, who's um, also speaking uh, as part of this spot, uh, has been working the last four years as a software engineer at Skyscanner. Uh, had a chance to build, run, and own many Python services at scale and production, mainly on async IO. Uh, gave uh, gave him an opportunity to contribute to uh, gRPC um, as well as several other uh, projects in the Python ecosystem and the open source community. So they're going to be speaking on, unsurprisingly, gRPC Python, C extensions, and async IO. So uh, welcome to you both. And uh, hello. Okay, let's get started. So, hello everyone. Welcome to join our talk. Today we are going to discuss how we build GRPC Python, how it utilizes Python C extensions, and how we integrate it with AsyncIO. If you have any question, um, feel free to post it in the Discord channel. Um, it's called hashtag talkGRPC and AsyncIO. So, um, please allow us to introduce ourselves again. So, this is Lili Zheng. And I'm a software engineer at Google. I have been a maintainer of GRPC Python since 2018. Paul, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you. Really. So, yeah, the, this is Paul. Um, first of all, I wanted to provide a great thankful to Skyscanner for uh, funding my time for working on that project uh, the last year. Uh, sadly, I'm not longer a member of the, the Skyscanner family. I'm, I'm currently working at uh, Honor.com. As most of you, I'm a Python enthusiast, but what I do like more is solving any kind of engineering problem. And I try to do my best also these last years for contributing to many different open source projects. Passing over to you, Lydia. Okay. So next, let's get started. So what is JRPC? As the name suggested, JRPC is an RPC framework that builds upon HTTP2 as its uh, transport protocol. So it's meant to be fast, lightweight, and it is designed for distributed systems. So it carries uh, some highlight features, for example, streaming RPC and various uh, load balancing policies and ways to do the load balancing. And we also provide interceptors so you can inject logic at any stage of an RPC. We also integrate well with Protobuf, so it enforces your API contract. Currently, we are getting around uh, 400,000 downloads per day. And on the right side is our cute new logo. And her name is Golden Retriever Pancake, and she's cute. So there's another reason for you to try out GRPC today. So before introducing GRPC Python, we have to introduce GRPC Core. Core is actually the component that handles all the HTTP uh, frame processing, serving, uh, compression, security, load balancing, all this complex stuff. <clears throat> and Python is just a thin wrapper over it. As you can see, it handles so much functionality, it would be unwise to build it again and again for each <coughs> different languages. So um, many languages like C++, Python, Ruby, we are just a thin wrapper over it. And in total, we have 14 supported languages. And it gives us not only better, better performance, but it also lowers our maintenance burden. Um, OK. OK. So the, the also gives us uh, some frictions. For example, sec faults. So Python developers really doesn't really um, familiar with sec faults, and we have seen a lot of complaints about don't know how to debug it, and it's complex. And also memory leaks. Python's memory management model is very different from C plus ones. It is very error prone when we are trying to manage the lifecycle of C plus object in Python space. 
as well as compilation across platforms. So compilation in Linux and Mac OS probably will be easy, but how about compile on Windows and ARM? To solve the, the compilation part, we not only distribute our source code, but we also distribute binary wheels. So, yeah, so gRPC Python users don't need to worry about that. What does Python C extension actually look like? So C extension, there are module written in C or C++. On the right side is a short example of it. Uh, as you can see, all this code, what it does is it creates a module and it trying to print the hello world. Um, on the first line, you can see the header python.edge. It includes all the API you needed for, for uh, manipulating Python objects within C++ space. It, it's quite complex to write. Uh, also, the API itself varies from version to version. So to make things easier, people are trying to come up with uh, simpler ways to do it. For example, like better C++ framework and glue code generators that helps the, to ease the pain of writing glue code. And there are many uh, ways to write C extensions in the market. And I'm going to talk about only three of the representative ones. Um, so first is PyCleaf. So PyCleaf, it is a templating language um, it works really well when you are tr just trying to expose C++ interface into Python space. But if you're trying to do something more complex than that, when you're trying to uh, meddle around with the threading model, life cycles, and it won't be sufficient. But next is PyBind 11, which is a portable lightweight head-only C++ library. And I can't really complain, um, it, but it requires people to code in C++. Um, since this is a PyCon, so I put it in the drawback side. But if you are a fan, C++ fan, maybe it's a plus for you. And finally, Sizen. So Sizen is a language very similar to Python. It's very easy to develop, and it's adopted by NumPy, uh, SCIPy, and TensorFlow. Uh, however, even though the language itself uh, claimed to be a superset of Python, but it's not a strict superset, you will see some caveat, uh, you will see some weird quirk of Size and language itself when you're trying to use it. So eventually, gRPC Python team decided to use Sizen um, because it is si similar to Python. So when gRPC Python users want to take a step ahead to help improve the library, they can. So let me uh, introduce what, how does Sizen work in a minute. So for example, we have a prime checker. So it does very simple math computations. Uh, you try to loop over uh, numbers and try to see if it is a factor of the number you are tracking. And we put it in the right place. You can import it, just saying import prime checker and then use it. What about Sizen? So first, Sizen not only uh, compiles Sizen specific code, you can also compile Python like the uh, entire, entirely Python uh, source code. But down below is a, a Sizen version of it. You can try to import library from C or C++ with C import. And you can also define static variables like uh, C def double root. And after that, you can compile the uh, Sizen provide tooling for you to compile it into uh, thousands of lines of C or C++ code. And your setup tools will help you to compile them into a shared uh, library object. And when you put the shared library object in the right place, you can just import it like any other Python module and use it. So when you are trying, so if you have ever trying to debug a Python 6 extension, you will find out it's a hard challenge. Because when you're trying to do GDB Python, like Python 3.7, uh, when you're trying to see the backtrace, all you can see is evaluate frame, evaluate frame, evaluate frame. It does nothing, like it makes people mad. Um, however, this is a problem troubling the Python maintainers as well. So they come up with this python.gdb.py script built for G GDB. It ships with every single um, C Python source release and you can find them in, their, uh, in your installation folder, in, in, in your source code in your downloaded source code folder. Um, after the, the Python GDB mode is turned on, suddenly GDB understands all the Python 
uh, variables. So you can see Python stack trace, you can see Python code, and when you're trying to print some variable, it doesn't say pi object, but instead it, it tells you what's inside that pi object. And next, so with all the effort to make uh, Python work with C++, and finally we got a Py JPC Python working with JPC core, but there is still one problem troubling us. So let's say we have a JPC server, and it's calling a method from JPC core. And it's running a POSIX thread. So all Python threads are POSIX threads. Unless you're using gevent or eventlet, and they will try to monkey patch all the uh, central library, including threading, and swapping out the POSIX threads with core routines. And OK, so we have a valid thread, and then in order to make it a server, we also need to need a polling thread and a bunch of executor thread. Each one RPC will consume enti an entire executor thread. So with limit number of executor thread, it also limit our uh, concurrency. To get to make things worse, um, there is this global interpreter lock that, that is restricting all the POSIX threads. So it not only makes the performance worse, but it also causes deadlocks when we are jumping from Python space to, to C++ space and back to Python space. Okay. Um, however, we find a solution. So next, Paul will discuss how we solve this challenge by using async IO. So let's give the stage to Paul. Thank you very much, Lady. Um, uh, could, you, could you stop sharing, please? I'm going to share yes. from my own. Um, where's the button? Okay, got it. Yeah, thank you. Oh, one moment. Yeah. Can you see my screen? Yeah, we're good. Perfect. So I think it was uh, almost one year, one year and a half ago when uh, we started that uh, initiative together with uh, Lady and other uh, members of the GRPC community. Uh, it was at that time that uh, at the Sky Scanner we were looking for, uh, because we were making a transition between HTTP or we were trying a transition between HTTP and GRPC. Uh, we had some of our main services running uh, with Python and SyncIO and we didn't have any solution for moving from HTTP to gRPC without giving up on the SyncIO. And this is the time when we started this initiative uh, together with gRPC for trying to, to solve that problem. So what was the first uh, headache that we had? Uh, as, you, as most of you uh, will know, um, when you are running uh, a SyncIO application and when you are using the weight syntax, Basically, what is happening behind the scenes is that you are returning back the control to the loop, providing a future, which basically would be called later for waking up the task that was um, that was put to sleep. Uh, this pattern, uh, which is the main pattern that is being used by AsyncIO, was not reproducible by using the primitives that they were exposed by the uh, C++ interface of gRPC because basically the main uh, interface for pulling events uh, was uh, a, blocking, a blocking interface. Not only this, also we needed a, a kind of IO manager, a system that would allow us to implement all of the socket network operations using the Sankiro. So we were facing two different problems here. The first one, the IO manager, was something that was addressable since uh, gRPC was providing a way for overriding that custom IO manager but there was no uh, unblocking uh, primitive for pulling the events for the gRPC core. Other frameworks like gEvent and Node.js, because different circumstances, they were able to address that issue. But suddenly, uh, the gRPC sub C++ team, uh, they implemented a new uh, completion queue uh, callback, which basically was based, um, uh, was based on callbacks. So basically, instead of having something that would block you, uh, you would be able to configure a callback, which basically uh, would be called when the event was there, which would allow us to chime the, this event through a, a, a SMQ filter. So yeah, I think uh, we had pretty much what we needed for uh, starting that initiative. And we said Eureka. And after uh, a few times, uh, after some days, we, were, we managed to have a first solution. Um, 
uh, which basically uses the, the, a new custom EO manager, a whole replacement of the all network operations, also using the callback completion queue. And the results were quite good. Uh, in the graph, we can see the different the performance difference between what uh, between the synchronous client, which is the version that we already had there, uh, versus the new um, implementation that was an async native implementation. For the client, for example, we went from not more than 10k queries per second using binary calls to almost 20k queries per second. And in the server, we also had a, a really, really nice boosting, moving from not uh, from almost 5k queries per second to all, more than 15k queries per second. So we were we were happy with the results that we got. But then another headache uh, came into our plates, uh, which was basically, as you as I already said, we had what we had already one client uh, implemented, which was the synchronous one. And we, uh, we we had a new one which was an asynchronous one, and it presented some challenges because uh, the synchronous stack would be there for a long time, maybe forever. And one of the possible issues that we could we could face in the future would be, for example, having an asynchronous application a server which basically calls a third party uh, library which behind the scenes uses the the synchronous the synchronous version. With the solution that we had on the table it wouldn't work. So we had to address that situation. Um, for addressing that situation, we thought in different, on different, on different ways for addressing it. Uh, the first thing that we thought was, okay, let's try to rewrite the whole single stack by using uh, the synchronous one. So all of the synchronous functions would end up basically calling an asynchronous, an asynchronous call. But uh, this, uh, uh, we didn't have, uh, we didn't have a clear idea that if it would work at last or not, and also the amount of work that it would need uh, would not be uh, negligible. The second uh, solution that we put on the table uh, was, for example, um, uh, changing a bit, the, changing a lot the C++ implementation by providing uh, by providing a way for having two coexisting stacks at the same time running at the same time, but. Uh, that seemed to not be also an easy solution on the table. And finally, we found out the solution that, uh, which the amount of changes that seemed to need uh, was affordable, which basically was, let's have one thread uh, where all of the gRPC IO operations would be executed. And in that way, would be able to not block the synchronous client that could be called or could be run on top of uh, an asynchronous application. And the first results that we got uh, by using that technique were quite good. So the impact on the performance, which was one of our main concerns, uh, was not uh, was was almost negligible. But then we start experimenting uh, some deadlocks. When we started experimenting these deadlocks, we started experimenting on ran random deadlocks at the moment that we tried to, for example, pass all of all of the synchronous test suite over an asynchronous context. And then is when we realized that we were having problems with uh, some contention with, uh, with, between some uh, GIL acquirers and some acquirers in the mutex, the mutex of, the, uh, of the gRPC code library. And then for addressing that issue, we had to put the proper GIL releases. And then is when uh, the performance uh, went down uh, in, a, in a substantial way. So basically the problem that we were facing uh, before adding the proper uh, release of the GIL is basically that uh, we had two threads, one thread going calling a gRPC curve function, which would acquire a mutex, which at the same time uh, would make a call to the callback, which will trigger a Python function that would like to acquire the shield. But at the same time, but at the same time, we also had a thread which was trying to acquire the shield. It, managed to acquire, but also made a syscall to the gRPC core and tried to acquire the mutex, but was not the mutex was already locked by the other thread. So we were facing a, a, a simple deadlock here. And for addressing this deadlock, the only way was always, if you we have to call a gRPC core, we had to um, uh, release the shield first. By releasing the shield, uh, what happened is that we uh, surfaced a lot of contention on uh, 
releasing at Kyren the Shield, and this is when the performance gets impacted a lot. And then we went for a second solution, which basically this second solution, which we call Polarset, we basically gave up on trying to use the callback compression tool. We gave up on using another IO manager. It was like starting over again. Uh, we basically, what we did is basically we implemented a solution where we will have a new thread. Uh, this thread will be pulling the gRPC core. And every time that we will have a new event from the gRPC core, we'll be waking up the event loop uh, thread of a SENKIO. And for doing so, but, and at the same time, avoiding as much as possible the contention for acquiring the shield, we'll be doing this by trying to avoid as much as possible Python code. So even we implemented that, that thread by using Python, most of the code that was executed for pulling and for waking up the event loop was using basically uh, yes, C++. No worries. Oh. So uh, basically this, uh, solution was uh, really good, had other good benefits. For example, we removed the burden, the burden of having to maintain a new OA manager. And the good thing is that the performance degradation was kind of affordable. So Eureka, again, so for the client, for example, we were able to, we managed to keep the same performance that we got in the first solution, but we had a significant uh, impact on the performance for the server, but a still a good boosting compared to with the synchronous one. And passing over to Libby. Okay, so thank you Paul for introducing our async IO integration. Um, the gRPC async IO API has been released as expander API since uh, 1.25. Feel free to uh, give a try. Also, it already passes all the Intel tests, which means it integrates well with all other gRPC languages and with historical version of gRPC. So, and also, we're integrating is with uh, Google Cloud Platform clients, and we're expecting some of them to be released in quarter three 2020. And the API reference can be found on gRPC.io website. Thank you. Now we take questions. All right. So um, does anyone have any questions here? I'll give it a minute because sometimes these um, creep in. And meanwhile, while we are waiting, um, mm -hmm. anyone who is in the, um, uh, anyone who's, uh, hold on. My brain just left me. Okay. <laughs> so, um, uh, so after the Q and a, um, everyone can uh, talk in the, what was the name of your talk again? See, that's the thing is trying to say yeah, GRPC. There it is. Yeah. yeah GRPC. GRPC and async IO. Yep. GRPC. And the, the, yep. So in the talk GRPC and async IO, you can go to that room as well for further discussion afterwards. I'm just Looking to see if anyone has any questions, post them here in Zoom or on uh, Discord if you have them there. And uh, we'll just uh, hang tight for a moment. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, like I was telling Camilla in the last talk, it, you know, my, my, my speech teacher used to say, if you don't get any questions, usually it means that you presented really well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So yeah, it actually it looks like it looks like uh, you're good. So uh, yeah, uh, hop over to talk to RPC and async IO on um, on Discord and uh, enjoy that conversation there. And uh, thank you both for uh, being here. Oh, actually, I have to do wow technology. Will this work for me. There we go.